Welcome back from the break. I hope you had some opportunities to sit down at one of the virtual tables and to meet some of your either help AG contacts or some of the people uh, from the industry that you might know that are here today. Um, again, I just want to make a little bit of advertisement for our feedback form. Make sure you fill it out so that you can participate in a lucky draw uh, for a nice staycation in, uh, in, in the UAE. Um, we will be announcing the winner uh, directly after the event. Uh, unfortunately, I am not allowed to participate myself. Otherwise, I would have tried because who doesn't need a, a weekend where you can uh, switch, off, switch off a little bit and enjoy the sun. Ahmed is saying he needs it as well. Um, <laughs> good. Web applications. Uh, you know, in HelpAG, we've been doing web application security for a lot of clients over a long, long period of time. We've worked with F5 networks since they started doing web application firewalls back in 2007, 2008 great products that they've really been able to build a, a good set of security features into the environment. One of the challenges that we have today about web applications and specifically the speed that uh, applications are being developed with uh, uh, now means that the way we build web application firewall policies and web application security policies is actually a little bit under stress. So being able to utilize some of the capabilities uh, around uh, identifying good and bad behavior is actually really important. You know, identifying good and bad behavior is very, very often done by all sorts of, uh, of methods that are very, very user unfriendly, like filling out captures and so, so, uh, such things. And these captures that are just getting more and more difficult to fill out because the machine learning and AI required to, to fill out those captures are evolving as well. And I know Ahmed is going to talk a little bit about that and how you're looking at the behavior of applications uh, and users on applications is actually adding a lot of security uh, to protecting that application. Ahmed, over to you. Thank you very, very much, Nikolai, for the introduction. So, uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Ahmed Mubarak, and I'm senior solutions engineer here at Shape uh, Security, which is now part of F5. Today, I will be talking about a specific class of attacks and the evolution of application security and how we can take this to the next level along with the joint forces with F5. So I'm going to talk about that specific class of attacks, shape, which shape has been concerned about since long time and which is application abuse and, and fraud. Applications abuse is one of the most difficult that applications or attacks we are seeing happening on, 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 on applications because there is no real distinction from an application point, point of view between a legitimate user who's trying to, to log in into, into his account with his username and password as to a, a, a criminal who is doing the very same thing but trying to log in with a stolen username and password. And those applications we are actually interact all of us we are interacting with those applications on daily basis we all have uh, online banking accounts uh, online let's say e-commerce accounts online maybe airline accounts and many other things so and as an application the native behavior of an application is to accept anonymous requests and this is how the attackers are abusing the inherent functionality so they are abusing the functions that you are putting out there for, for your legitimate users to access. They are, not, they are not doing or they are not exploiting any vulnerability. They are simply using the channels that are available for your legitimate users and to commit fraud, of course. A great example of this is a credential stuffing attack where attackers are doing this at a very massive scale using maybe millions or billions of stolen username and passwords of course using a huge network of, of botnet but your applications are still servicing those login requests as it should since you know without knowing the attacker is abusing that functionality and once the attacker figures out which accounts are valid 
or uh, can access to, or he, he, he got access to, he can do one of two things. Either resell those accounts on the dark web for a high, much higher value, so it's all about business, or they can use those accounts and commit fraud with. Unfortunately, there is a lot of evolution of these attacks campaigns happening today, and I will, I will be addressing some of them or, or maybe most of them. So now attackers becoming extremely good in bypassing traditional security controls that we all have in place, especially when, you are, when they are using automation tools. Uh, this graph is one from our recent integrations with one of our customers, and it's not uncommon to see this traffic pattern during the onboarding process. This is actually the login traffic or transactions happening over the course of few days, as you can see here. What was happening with this customer is that they have been battling for some time with an application abuse problem that was hitting or, or, or hammering their, their login pages on their website. And their monitoring tool, tools did not reflect that or their, their did not reflect the, the expected diurnal pattern of, of legitimate human, human logins. So what happened here, when, when Shape actually went in line, we were able to identify not only the legitimate uh, traffic or a human login traffic, which is highlighted in a green here, but also some good automated tooling, such as user experience monitoring tools that is, is taking the orange color and all the red color was coming or uh, was an attack, let's say traffic coming from specifically five attackers. So overall 94% of those attacks or 94% uh, of, of logging requests into their websites were automated. Imagine 94% of the overall ratio of the traffic they are receiving. So now this slide should show you why this attack was difficult to remediate using existing technologies. It is very simple reason because these guys are being very good in crafting those attacks. These attacks are well crafted to circumvent IP rate limits, IP reputation, and geo-blocking. Even they are quite good at distributing their attacks among enough botnets. So those controls that we have in place, me and you, becomes quickly becomes irrelevant. In this case, this particular case, the attacker you can notice, or these five attackers were coming from 600,000 IPs, 10,000 different network source networks, and pretending to be 95,000 uh, different browser environments. So this means one thing, they do their best and they are extremely good at it in avoiding a single signal by which they could be mitigated. So what happens over the time, a lot of organizations became much more intelligent in identifying these attacks. But again, there is another evolution happens from the attacker or the dark website, all right, where this is what you see here is the next step of, of how attackers are, are beginning to look like generic human users. So they started to use tools such as headless browser along with a tool called or like puppeteer to code interactions, human-like interactions within their request. So now the attacker can encode things like mouse movements, uh, interactions, and, and, and maybe key pressing or key presses, specific key presses uh, within the online form that they are trying to gain access to. To bypass what? To bypass some more sophisticated controls. For example, we can see here that in this slide, the interaction with this online form was like was not quite organic because the attacker was always clicking at the top left grid coordinate also the key presses always happen in a very organized fashion and very fast which doesn't look like a human and at this and and the interesting point here 
at, at this point of my conversation with almost all of my customers, the topic of CAPTCHA normally comes up. So while everyone recognizes this is a fairly terrible experience for, for end users or for your consumers, some of my customers feel fairly confident that CAPTCHA is doing a good job in identifying automation. But the unfortunate reality here is that it's a quite cheap and easy to bypass these CAPTCHAs using services on the public web, things like to CAPTCHA or death by CAPTCHA. So, and it's easy for attackers to scale those services. Why? Because it can only cost them $1.39 for every 1,000 text-based CAPTCHAs or $2.99 for Google reCAPTCHA version two and even version three. Now, what, what even you, they can make it an auto in, happening in a programmatical way using APIs. Like whenever I presented by CAPTCHA, what happens is that this device will call an API or make an a, a call out API into a human farm to solve this CAPTCHA as you can see here, because what's actually happening on the back end is that this by CAPTCHA or to CAPTCHA is proxying this CAPTCHA request to a really human who working in low wage environment who complete who actually completes the capture request and return it or respond back with it and this is becoming very popular but a final example of this step in evolution we see how attackers begin not only to pretend to be a generic human by encoding random or something random mouse mouse movements and and clicks or or, or uh, key pressing cadence they are started to be very good in emulating a specific human behaviors and the specific even a human users like users identity a great example of this i'm not sure if you are aware of the genesis marketplace or not but a great example is the genesis marketplace the genesis marketplace simply compromise com comprises of two of two components the first one is the malware that lives on the victim machines and captures not only the username and password but it captures really other terrifying data points that i will cover shortly the second component of the genesis marketplace is the actual marketplace itself where fraudsters and attackers can go and download an entire digital identity of the victim and use that to commit fraud. So this is what, what, what a user of the Genesis Marketplace will see as soon as they log in. What's interesting about these digital identities is that there is one to one mapping or relationship between the identity and the attacker. So if me, I sign up for an account on Genesis Marketplace, and I buy one of those digital identities, then I completely own it and it gets removed out of the marketplace. So it is just to be used by me. Now, these digital identities are generally a bit more expensive than credentials you expect to see or to buy from the dark web. So often I can go and buy millions or billions of credentials for a few dollars. But here in Genesis Marketplace, the digital identities tend to have an individual cost of $40 plus, depending on the sites to which the bot has access to. So, but on the flip side, yes, I mean, you paid that much amount, but what you are getting, once you buy a single identity, you will get everything that the malware has captured, every username and password interaction for every website uh, that was or, or has been visited by that specific victim. In this particular example, the victim who has logged into 114 known websites, including iCloud, PayPal, eBay, and many others, and the malware has collected all of those users' names and digital pass and digital identities. There, there, there are also another 370 sites that those accounts were 
the malware has identified a username and password being entered, but they are less popular websites, so they get pushed into a different category or a different bucket. Okay, as I mentioned, the malware doesn't just steal username and password, but it steals an entire, entire let's say, uh, digital identity. So when I log in, when we all log in into a website, we all get presented by that box, remember me, all right? And if the browser is a little bit intelligent, also it will capture or it will, it will create a cookie and will capture some other parameters of that user, things like the language he's using, the phone, the device itself, in order what to actually for a legitimate user or a legitimate purpose in order to recognize this returning user. Now, the authors of those malwares or this specific malware, they know this and therefore the malware steals these parameters as well. It steals the cookies, the user agent string, the language, the font, and all of the things that they are being used by the victim device, even things like the hardware specifications, CPU cores, the RAM that is available to that device, even the screen size or the actual window size of the browser and the overall screen size. Why? Because they know all of these data points are being used or, or, or are being used uh, by fraud platforms in order to look at or to identify fraudsters and differentiate between good and bad users. So they want to bypass by, by, by acquiring the entire parameters, they can easily bypass a lot of those fraud controls. In this case, what happens, let's say I can go ahead, I buy the identity, I imported, I import the username and password as well as all the parameters into a version of Chromium and I can go ahead and grab an IP from that specific region. So I will look like a, a returning user to that website and I will gain, get, gain an immediate access to all of these uh, accounts. So also on the same plane of evolution is that attackers who have access to higher quality data, let's say a freshly stolen credentials or stolen PII, instead of using botnets, they might use actual humans, human farm or human labor to bypass those fraud controls. For example, they, let's say they know that if they apply for a credit card using a real human over VPN network, they are much more likely to get away with it at scale using a bank of a human. Equally there, if they, if they have those fresh fished credentials, they might choose to log in into those, those accounts manually rather than using a botnet and risk giving themselves away. So at the highest level of applications attack is that attackers who are using really human interaction that's going to bypass much any bot uh, mitigation control in place. So now from organization's perspective, what we, what we find is that our users tend to try to stop fraud using different rules with the mechanisms that they already have. They might have rules on their WAF designed to stop or, or to stop botnets, like things like if we see lots of login attempts from a particular IP address or a particular IP range or source network, I might decide or put a rule that to block that set of transaction or that IP range. Equally, we, we, there are fraud rules that we know about and it's scoring based. So for example, if a user is using an incognito mode and if they are committing a high number of transactions on a particular user account, then block that transaction under those fraud rules. And finally, the identity rules, which are often used to identify good returning users, but they are limited in scope. If let's say, if we see a user return, maybe only let that user uh, stay logged into their account for 
an hour or so, or as long as the browser tab is open. We also find customers that tend to extend mobile sessions much more because, because of the fact or due to the fact that most people use only one mobile device to log in into their, their, their accounts. However, what we know about fraudsters and what we are experiencing from our investigation using our anti-fraud engine is that fraudsters are extremely good uh, at probing for the gaps in our controls. So they know that if I use a wide enough botnet or enough IP space, or if they don't give away the parameters that we have seen under the fraud rules, and maybe if they can collect enough digital identities to bypass those fraud rules, they can they can actually be successful to continue to commit their fraud and execute and execute these attacks. So from shape perspective, once we are in line and mitigating, what we deliver is a clean pipeline of a human transactions as an outcome of our leading bot mitigation engine. The level of automation that you might still see in this graph tend to be very low, often less than 1%. And this is actually just those attackers who continue to probe for weaknesses, but she stays on top of that. So once we have that clean subset of a human behaviors and transactions, we can start to inspect those transactions for more sophisticated forms of a human fraud and mitigate that without relying on those rigid rules of WAF uh, fraud and identity that we have seen. A great example of that is how we use a human comprehensible in indicators to identify fraudulent indications or indicators and, and fraudulent users. These are things like a specific keyboard operations that used by fraudsters to perform specific operation within an account or maybe accessing lots of accounts uh, from a particular or single device, or maybe using copy and paste shortcuts in order to fill out a form or a username and password, because it's fairly unusual to see all the time legitimate users are copying and pasting their user's name, their username and passwords whenever they need to log in into an application. Legitimate users usually use auto-filling and auto-filling features that are embedded within the browser or maybe Apple Keychain as well. So therefore, the, these are just sample indicators that we, 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 we use and they are easy for us as a humans to understand, but there are a lot of more uh, sophisticated ones that are not irrelevant for, for the context uh, of this conversation like this one. So we will stick to the human comparison, uh, comprehensible ones. For example, this is one of the signals that, that we monitor. Fraudsters tend to use a lot more function keys on their keyboard than legitimate users. In fact, from our investigation, we noticed that fraudsters, they use 49% uh, of the time, they are using those shortcuts, whereas legitimate users, they tend to use these unusual keys a lot less, even less than 1% of the time. You're probably thinking, or you might be raising a concern, okay, if you rely on this signal, you might have a high false positive rate, and you are absolutely right here. But the fact is that, or the fact here is that, we don't use these rules in isolation. We correlate them together into our machine learning and AI engine, along with other hundreds and hundreds of signals in order to decide whether it's a fraud or not. Another, another, another signal we look at is fraudsters tend to rely on these keyboard operations because they are interacting with an application that is outside the environment. So let's say they have a file of stolen PII, high quality PII. So what they do, they tend to open, to open the file and to reduce the size of the browser so that they have two windows. One is for the notepad where they can copy and paste into that online form. Uh, and this is what we call it unusual screen utilizations. So we can see here that 
this can help us to identify fraudulent interactions. In fact, 28% of fraudulent will have these unusual identifiers, whereas less than 1% of real users will have those unusual screen utilization signals. So also fraudsters are 250 times more likely to use control V than an individual legitimate user whenever they are filling uh, an online form. That's another thing we look at. Finally, we know the fraudsters, they tend to interact with, with a web and mobile application in a predetermined way. They have, they have objectives in mind. They want to log in into the account. They want to check the balance. They want to add the receiver, wire the money, and then log off. Then repeat the same thing on a different victim account. Whereas good users or the good user journey is totally different. They tend, we as legitimate users, we tend to, to have like a different route around the account. That we might log in, check the balance, do a couple of oper operations before adding a payee or executing a transactions. Even myself, when, want, when I want to add actually uh, a payee and transfer money, I really spend like maybe a good amount of time to find out where is that button where I can add a payee. So by looking of all of these signals, piecing them together and identifying the entire journey of, of the user across the web and mobile application, we can identify fraudsters and separate the good and bad users. So now, uh, going back to those security controls that I spoke about fraud and identity rules that we implement, shape instead always, or we use a different approach. What we do is we always try to answer three fundamental questions for each web and mobile transactions. The first one is, are you human? We need to very accurately determine the difference between an automated attack and a real user who is coming in from their own device or not. Equally, we need to look at the intent of the user. Is this, is this a user who is legitimately trying to check the balance and add a payee? or this is a fraudster who is committing, let's say, these sets of transactions at scale in order to defraud their victim. And finally, are you who you say you are? Are you using your own identity? Is, that, is this that you, Ahmed, for example? And this has multiple perspectives. Number one, we need to spot uh, fraudsters who are using stolen identity or identities. And secondly, you want to make sure that the legitimate users that are more easily able to access those applications. So we believe if you have an accurate mechanism of identifying, let's say, good returning users to your web application, you can let that user to stay logged on for days, weeks, or even months. They are much more likely to generate more revenue by returning to your application because they can transact a lot more easily. Equally, we can make sure that we can remove those other friction inducing elements like CAPTCHA because we know that they, they, they don't do a great job in, 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 in uh, stopping these kinds of applications. And I'm 100% sure this is a good user. So why to present him with a CAPTCHA? So summing up the session, we know that attackers are driven by their own ROI. The reason evolution parameters even existed is because attackers were extracting values or a specific value from their victim. So they have their own imperative to evolve and become more and more uh, sophisticated. Also, <coughs> sorry, we know that attackers are looking for gaps in, in your security and the fraud and identity tools and processes. They, they, they probe for those gaps in order to continue to commit fraud. Finally, and more importantly, for me as a web user, as well as we all are nowadays, security and fraud controls do not need to introduce friction for legitimate users. 
so you can safely extend the session for those good users and if you have these controls in place you can also remove these friction and inducing elements like capture because you can very accurately identify attacks fraud and legitimate users with that i would like to thank you very much for your time uh, please do swing by by our virtual let's say booth or meeting table if you have any questions or comments Equally, you can email me at a.mubarak uh, at f5.com in case you have other topics you would like to discuss. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.